shield and my stay. Protect and defend me through all of my days. People assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate, because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity refers to behavior that's crooked, while sin refers to moral failure. And transgression, this is a fascinating word that you for sure haven't used in conversation recently. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. 
In Old Testament Hebrew, the noun is pesha, and the verb is pasha. In the New Testament, the Greek word is paraptoma. They're usually translated as transgression, sometimes as rebellion, and in older translations as trespass. These words refer to ways that people violate the trust of others. Pesha describes the betrayal of a relationship, and since there are many kinds of relationships, a lot of different behaviors can be called Pesha. Like if two nations are in a relationship, we would call that a treaty, and Pesha would describe the breaking of that agreement. Like in the biblical book of 2 Kings, we read, after the death of King Ahab, Moab Pashad with Israel. Now, this is usually translated, Moab rebelled against Israel. But in biblical Hebrew, you don't pasha against someone, you pasha with them. That is, you break trust with that person. The same idea appears in an Old Testament law about theft. If an Israelite is away on a trip and somebody sneaks into their house and steals something, that's robbery. But if the thief was your neighbor, it's pasha, because there's someone you should be able to trust. Or there's a story about Jacob running away from Laban, his uncle. Laban accuses Jacob of stealing some idol statues. He searches all of Jacob's belongings and he finds nothing. So Jacob shouts, what is my Pesha? How have I violated your trust? But the sad irony is that the statues were stolen by Jacob's wife, who is Laban's own daughter. Talk about breaking trust. So Pesha involves one person or group violating a relationship of trust with another. And this is a really common word in the Bible because it's one long story about a broken relationship between God and the Israelites. At Mount Sinai, they agreed to worship only their God and to care for the poor among them, but they didn't. And so God raised up prophets to confront them, like Micah, who said, I'm full of power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and courage, so I can declare to Jacob his Pesha. Or the prophet Amos, he accused the Israelites of Pesha, specifically for idolatry and selling the poor for a pair of sandals. He also accused other nations, like Tyre, who profited from capturing whole towns and then selling them into slavery. Or the Ammonites for murdering the innocent to enlarge their borders. For Amos, these are all acts of Pesha. They violate the universal trust that exists between all humans who are made in the image of God. He watched these leaders ignore or justify the mistreatment of humans in the name of national security or a strong economy. But for Amos, it was a betrayal of humanity. And it makes perfect sense why these prophets associate Pesha with words like treachery or falsehood. In the Greek New Testament, the Apostle Paul develops this portrait of humans as trust breakers, using the word paraptoma. He recalls the story in Genesis about Adam, that means humanity in Hebrew. And in that story, humanity breaks trust with God and seizes authority to discern good and evil on their own terms. Paul calls this the paraptoma of Adam, humanity's violation of trust with God and with each other. And it leads to a complicated web of betrayed and broken relationships leading towards violence and death. But for Paul, that is not the last word. He says, if death came to all by the paraptoma of a human, how much more will God's gracious gift overflow to many by means of a human, Jesus the Messiah? Instead of letting humanity destroy itself in treachery, God raised up a human who would allow our Pasha to do its worst to him. Here Paul is drawing on the prophet Isaiah's portrait of the suffering servant, the one who would commit no violence or have any treachery on his lips, yet he would be counted among those Pasha, bearing their failures and interceding on their behalf. And the story of the Bible, that God's response to humanity's Pasha and Paraptoma was to be trustworthy on our behalf. The apostles claim that in Jesus, God took responsibility for our betrayal so that he could open up a new future and a new way to be human, the way of faithfulness, trustworthiness, and integrity. That's the kind of human that Jesus was and is, and it's the kind of humans he wants to create as he faithfully guides our world into the new creation. And that's the fascinating story behind our biblical words for transgression. Hello. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. My, uh, my job is to welcome you. That's an enjoyable job. I'm glad you're here. 
Glad to see all of you. Uh, reminds me of this fellow that was that was needing work. So he saw the sign that said now hiring. So I went in and he told the fellow I see you're hiring. Uh, any chance you would consider me? And he said, Well, have you got any um, references from your last employment? And he said, Well, no, because the last four years I've been in Yale. He said, Oh, you've been at Yale. Well, I'm I'm sure we can hire you. You're probably overqualified for anything we've got, but if you're interested, uh, yeah, I'll come in. He said. Well, I'm interested because I really do need a job. <laughs> We're glad you're here and welcome. Let's look at the announcements this morning. Restoration Heralds are here. Pick them up. Uh, we will not be meeting for the next several, next two Wednesday nights at least. I have word on that later, but the next two Wednesday nights we will not be meeting. Uh, Serving Spoon Community Dinner is Thursday the 23rd. Have that in mind. Uh, see Sherry for that. And the uh, monthly fellowship meal is the third, first Sunday in October. So look forward to those. and. It's good to see all of you today. It's great to be in the Lord's house, to, to have opportunity to, to fellowship. Excuse my breathing. It's not very dependable these days, but I'll endure it if you will. <laughs> You're the ones probably suffering, but it's good to have you here. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that we have the privilege of coming together. We thank you for the church. We know that this is our privilege because of the love that you've had for us and the willingness of your loving heart to send your son to suffer and die for us. We thank you that in him is life and it's because of the life in him that we have life. It's because of his promised presence to be here this morning that, that coming to assemble where he said, where even two are met in, in your name that he's here. And Father, we thank you for that. We ask your direction upon everything we do today. We pray every thought that we entertain, everything that we do, every word we speak might be to your glory, to the honor of your son Jesus, and might build us up and help us to be better servants in your kingdom. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's worship together.
The 13th verse of the second chapter of Titus mentions the great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the 14th verse, speaking of that great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself from all iniquity to redeem to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people and purify unto himself a people we're meeting around the table that reminds us of that he gave not just things he gave himself and Paul in that verse mentions two reasons to redeem us from all iniquity. He ransomed us. We were under the clutches of sin and death. And a ransom had to be paid because of our sin. And he did that. He redeemed us. He gave himself to redeem us, to buy us out of the clutches of Satan and the clutches of sin and were redeemed because he was willing to do that. But not just redeem us, to purify us. Not only did he forgive our past sins, but he makes it possible for us as we live with, live, live with him and live out his will in our lives to live, live a pure life, not by our, by our power, but by the power of his forgiveness and his strength. So by his grace, 
we have been redeemed and purified. And we remember that this morning. But there's another element to it. Because not only were there two things involved in the debt he paid for us, but there's two things that are to be our response to purify unto himself a people, and here's the next phrase, for his own possession. And while we remember what he did when he gave his life for us, it should remind, remind us when we come to this table, and each time we think of that sacrifice, that he has bought us. In Corinthians, Paul words it this way, you're not your own you're bought with a price. Glorify God, therefore, in your bodies. We are to be God's people. Is there any purpose in life that could be higher than living to glorify God? And yet, because of what Christ has done in redeeming and purifying us, that becomes our purpose, to glorify him. And what? Be zealous for his work. So we not only think of what he did when we come to this table, but we think of what we're to be. We're his, purchased with nothing less than the blood and the sacrificed, brutally beaten body of our Lord. We've been purchased as his, his possession, and remind us that we're to be zealous of good works. We remember what he did, and we remember since that we're no longer our own. We're his. He purchased our lives, and they're to be lived out, glorifying him. Father, we remember now what you've done. You've sent your son. You allowed him to know the terrible punishment and an agony beyond our imagination to redeem us, to purchase us. You've made us yours, Father. How glorious that is. And help us every day as as we remember the broken body, the shed blood, help us to remember that we owe you our very lives and to, to take joy and pleasure in living out your purpose and living zealously and victoriously for you in this world. We ask your strength to do that in the name of Jesus your Son and our Savior. Amen.
Father, we've just been reminded of the price you paid for us. We count it a privilege, Lord, to be able to return now a portion of the blessings that, that you've bestowed upon us. But Father, we know that all we might give is about a paltry offering compared to what you've given us. So help us to give gratefully to give cheerfully, Father, to give with thanksgiving for the blessings you give, for the redemption we know in your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.
Hope you're not ready to go home yet. <laughs> but we are all ready to go to the home, aren't we? The greatest home there is. You know, the great thing about that home is we don't have to go there and have dirty dishes and laundry and deal with all those things that really, if you want to go there, you, you feel like if you're at home, sometimes you have to work more, don't you? Uh, we're going to go to a place that none of us can even imagine. Are we ex you excited about that? I'm excited about that because, listen, we all know, we look at this world, and to me, it's just another nudge in the direction saying, it won't be long, son. It won't be long, daughter. It won't be long. And I'm, I'm ready to call you home. That's exciting. It is. Here's the thing is, uh, we've been talking about this idea of drawing closer to God, this idea of sanctification, and, and really... That's, that's just that process that occurs once we have made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to draw near and near to Him each and every moment that we can. Knowing fully well, we will never reach that perfection, of course, right? But also knowing that we are called to try to draw toward that. That's tough, isn't it? Seems like some high aspirations there for, for everyone, especially when we look at our lives, our daily lives, and think about the mistakes that we make and the imperfections that we have, oh my goodness gracious, it makes it really rough, doesn't it? But you know, I'm thankful for a Lord who knows that each and every moment. And, and thankful for a Lord who has paid the ultimate sacrifice through His Son. So thankful. You know, um, there's... I'm known as one of these coaches. Maybe uh, you've had a coach like this before, I don't know. I'm known as one of these coaches that will push the players to the edge. And what I mean is that they think they have pushed as far as they can. Listen, you can push a little bit farther. I truly believe that. I believe we can't limit ourselves. And sometimes they'll come to me and say, say I'm, I'm hurt, coach. My leg is hurt. My answer is always this. You've got another leg. You've got another leg. Now call it a little bit cold, maybe callous. But listen, don't find an excuse. Find a way to overcome. Or I'll tell them, let me see your other leg. I'll kick that one, and the other one will feel better. <laughs> Is that true, Jacob? Yes. He was my son. You know. oh, I haven't kicked too many legs. So I don't think so. Not too bad. But here's the thing. Then we see somebody in a game, and they're bleeding. And it's the end of the world, isn't it? It's the end of the world, and why is that? Well, blood is that one thing that kind of symbolizes life, doesn't it? it symbolizes life for a lot of us. And when we see blood coming out of us, well, um, you realize that you've paid another price, don't you? You've paid a price for it. So when we say that we've paid for this, or this day with blood, sweat, and tears, what that really means is that we've given our all to reach a goal, doesn't it? How many of y'all have paid for something with blood, sweat, and tears? How many of y'all have done that? Okay, if, if you all haven't, I bet you'll have an opportunity to at some point. And uh, that's not trying to be mean. That's not trying to be uh, saying, oh, I hope that happens to you. But I believe until you realize that, until you've paid for something with blood, sweat, and tears, you don't understand the sacrifice that it takes to be able to accomplish something. Now, we begin, as I said, we continue to speak about this idea of sanctification. And it's the idea that we are called to draw near to Christ as we continue this Christian walk. In fact, Hebrews 10.10 10 summarizes this idea very well. It tells us this. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. As I was working on today's sermon... I was looking at some old gospel hymns, some newer songs, um, and I was pleasantly surprised to find the number of songs out there that mention the blood of Christ. I bet y'all can think of some right now. In fact, how about Just As I Am, right? Blessed Assurance. Of course, Power in the Blood, that's pretty straightforward. It's definitely in that one, right? But if you go through all these different hymns, all these different songs, you're going to realize that it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome that there's all that emphasis in these songs, in these hymns. And there's hundreds more that I couldn't even touch 
hundreds more that I can even go through all of them. I don't have time to do all that. But why do these songs put so much emphasis on the blood of Jesus? Well, it's because the Bible puts a lot of emphasis on the blood of Jesus, doesn't it? God's Word does. One man, he actually put together a collection of what the Bible says about the blood of Jesus. And this is a pretty cool collection. It's going to be on the screen. And if you want this, I'd be happy to send these to you. But look at this collection and look at the way it kind of runs here. Acts 20 verse 28 says, we were bought with blood. And I'm summarizing what it talks about here. Romans 3.25, we are forgiven through the blood. Romans 5.9, we are justified by the blood. Ephesians 1.7, we have redemption through his blood. Ephesians 2, 12 through 15, peace was made through his blood. Hebrews 9, 14, we are cleansed by the blood. Hebrews 13, verses 11 through 12, we are made holy through his blood. 1 John 1, 7, we are purified from all sin through his blood. And then finally in Revelation 12, 11, we overcome Satan through his blood. See, there's this little little journey that occurs here through his blood, doesn't it? You see how that works? See, it means more than just one thing. The blood of Jesus is a powerful and effective force in our lives. When we speak of blood, we speak of life. Now this weekend, we remember what happened 20 years ago, don't we? And for many of us, we remember exactly where we were what we were doing, oh, I can tell you to the detail exactly what happened. I remember hearing the first report on the radio as I was driving in my car. And my first response is like, what? That doesn't sound right. Uh, it's just got to be some sort of fluke that happened. Then you hear about the second one that's hit. Since then, so many have sacrificed their lives, haven't they? So many have shed their blood for each of us. You know, we don't truly know who has done this. We don't truly know how many have sacrificed and paid that ultimate price. But we remember. But there was one initial thing that happened on 9-11. You know, we remember we had the first two planes that hit the World Trade Center. And then, of course, the Pentagon. But there was one thing that happened on Flight 93. And this was one of those hijacked flights. And you know, I, I can't really describe it as well as I can show you. So if you would, we're going to watch a, a short clip, a short video here, if you can take the lights down, about what happened on Flight 93 at a certain point. Let's watch this. This is Lisa Jefferson, shift supervisor. I understand your plane has been hijacked. Yes. I'm Todd Beamer. I'm on United Flight 93. We're, uh, we're over Ohio, maybe. Uh, the hijackers have knives, and they're in the cockpit flying the plane, I guess. How many passengers are aboard this flight? I'm maybe 40. Oh. Two were lying in the corridor. The captain and first officer. The captain and first officer. I don't know if. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Todd? If at any time you think your life is threatened, lay down the phone, but don't hang up. Leave the line open. No, I'm okay. I can talk. Do you know what they want? Money? Ransom? What? No, no, I don't. Are you there? 
guess I'm here. I'll be here as long as you need me. Uh, hold on a second, okay? I'll be back. You see you there? Yes, I'm here. Lisa, you call my wife and kids. And you tell them just in case. I'll tell them what you told me. What do you think, Lisa? Should we do it? I stand behind you, Todd. Lisa, do me a favor. Of course. Say the Lord's Prayer with me. Right now, Todd? Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's roll. Todd, are you still there? Lisa, release the call. Release the call. John 15, 13. Greater love have, has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. See, Todd and Lisa had that conversation, and they knew that they had to lean on God for the strength to do what had to be done. We watch this clip, and we understand that ultimate sacrifice. Those brave souls on that United Flight 93, they paid the ultimate price. They laid down their lives for countless others. See, many lived because of the actions of a few. They shed their blood. They shed their blood. See, that was the first really true act after 9-11 of deciding that uh, somebody was going to give up their life for others. And they saved countless, countless lives that day. Nobody could even put a true number on how many lives were saved. History is filled with many who have shed their blood for others. But here's the thing is, when we talk about shed blood, even many non-Christians, they know that the Bible tells us 
that Jesus died on Friday and he rose on Sunday and that he shed his blood on that cross. Amen? He shed his blood. It's hard to watch that, isn't it? It really is. We, it brings back a lot of memories. A lot of us didn't know what happened, exactly happened right when that occurred. It wasn't until long after that that we started getting stories and wind of what actually did happen. But here's the thing is that we pay for things with blood, sweat, and tears. But when you ultimately lay down your life for those who you love, that is the true ultimate sacrifice. But then we go to Jesus, and we ask this. We said, why? Why was his blood shed on the cross? And why is it that it's so important to us as Christians? Why is that so important? What difference does it make that he died on the cross? I mean, again, as I mentioned, there are tons of heroes throughout history that have laid down their lives so that others may live. Tons. Well, our main passage this morning tells us why. We're going to read that in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 19. It's going to be on the screen behind me. And it says this, You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Do you know what ransom really means? Do you know what that means? Ransom when, is when you're kidnapped by a bad guy, right? Think about it this way. You're kidnapped by a bad guy and, and held against your will. And then the people that love you, they might pay a ransom to get you back. And, and here's the key is that the more important you are to them, the higher the ransom can be. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, Jesus, he came as a ransom for us. Actually, Richard kind of talked about this a little bit this morning. <laughs> I thought that was great. He came as a ransom for us. We were so important to God that Jesus paid for us with his blood. He died to buy us back from something. But what did he buy us back from? The ESV, it says, We are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers. By the way, futile means empty. And that's why another version that we have says that we were bought back from our empty way of life. Now, what can make our lives empty? The answer is this. The emptiness in our lives is there because we have been cut off from God. See, there's a, there's a void there. There's something missing. We've been cut off from God. There's a famous psychologist, and his name is Carl Jung, and he wrote this. He said, Those psychiatrists who are not superficial have come to the conclusion that the vast neurotic misery of the world could be termed a neurosis of emptiness. Men cut themselves off from the root of their being, from God, and then life turns empty, inane, meaningless, without purpose. So when God goes, goal goes. When goal goes, meaning goes. When meaning goes, Value goes, and life turns dead on our hands. See, if God is not in our lives, there is no purpose for us. There is no reason for our existence. There's no hope that life is going to get any better than what it is right now. There's no hope. And there's no future beyond the grave. If we are cut off from God in our lives then our lives will be empty. And that's exactly what, what Jung was saying there. 
And that's what the Bible has always said. And the Bible says what cuts us off from God is our sin, isn't it? It's our sin. And now people inherently know this. I mean, you, you know it to be true. That's why when you do something that you ought not to do, guess what happens? Well, you experience shame and guilt, don't you? And that's why when you remember bad things from your past, there's this wave of pain, painful regret that just overcomes you. And so a lot of people, they sense the need to pay for their sin or their sins. Somehow, right? Got to be able to do this. Many believe if they can just do enough good things, they can cover the bad things. And that's why many people, when they're asked if they're going to go to heaven, well, they wonder if they've been good enough to go to please God, right? They, they wonder if they've done enough good things. There's a big dark spot in their lives. And they're wondering if the sheet that they've placed over their shame is big enough to hold their past. Or if that darkness they feel is peeking out someplace. A Reader's Digest once told of a 67-year-old man, and his name is Bill. And listen to this. He donated over 100 pints of blood over his years. 100 pints of blood. No doubt, many people owe their lives to this man's kindness, his willingness to give. When asked if his good deeds would get him into heaven, he replied, he said, when that final whistle blows and St. Peter asks, what did you do? I'll just say, well, I gave 100 pints of blood. That ought to get me in, right? That ought to get me in. Well, I've got news for Bill. His 100 pints of blood, they aren't going to cut it, are they? In fact, if he gave 1,000 pints of blood, it's not going to count it. In fact, you could give all of your blood to the Red Cross, and you could give all of your possessions to the poor, and you could give all of your life to save the life of someone else, and you still couldn't pay off the sins of your past. Listen to that. Yes, there are people who have given their lives to save others. But there's something missing. There's something missing there. The Bible tells us there's only one blood that can cover my sins, and that's the blood of Jesus, amen? That's the blood of Christ, the only blood. Only his blood can pay the debt of my failures. Why is that? Well, because my blood is tainted. My blood is tainted. My good deeds are stained. Romans 3.10, it declares, None is righteous, no, not one. Not one of us. No matter what I might do to pay for my sins, they'd still be there. Have you ever seen a farm where the owner has uh, put their old, rusty cars, trucks, and refrigerators out in the woods? If you haven't, you haven't lived in Franklin long enough. I'll just tell you that, okay? Because I'm telling you, if you drive around just a bit you are going to see some used car lots in people's houses, right? This is the way it is. Why do they do that? Why do people do that? Well, it's the old saying. It's, it's out of sight, out of mind, right? I don't want to go pay to have this thing totaled, or I want to go you know, pay to take it somewhere. I'm just going to let it sit there, right? We'll see. Uh, we'll make it a, a new place for trees to grow up and through it, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen this. Out of sight, out of mind. The trees are going to hide the trash, but the trash, guess what, is still there. It's still there. At least until somebody comes along to haul it away, right? At some point. And that's kind of what happens when people try to hide their sins behind their good deeds, isn't it? Out of sight, out of mind. This is the way we approach it. But the sins are still there. Unless someone comes along to haul it away. And that's what Jesus does. You see, Jesus not only died to forgive your sins, he rose from the dead to clean everything up and give you a new life. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, it tells us, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin 
that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, once you've been baptized into Christ, you've died to your sins. Your sins, they lay at the bottom of the water. They stay there. They're, they're there. But when you rise up out of the baptistry, you walk in newness of life. You die to your sins by the power of the cross. And you rise to a new life by the power of the resurrection. And see, that's why the cross and the empty tomb are so central to Christianity. That's why it's so important. Now, Jesus, he did all that for us. He died, and he was buried, and he rose from the grave to give you and I salvation. He did it all. He did it all for us. And here's the thing is that you can't do anything to earn God's forgiveness. Nothing at all. You can't earn it. But here's what you can do is you can do things to accept it. See, there's a different approach, isn't it? You can accept it. You believe in Jesus. Number one, Acts 16, 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. There's no great series of lessons that you need to go to classes to learn about this, by the way. Very simple. All you need to know to be saved is that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of God, and that he came to die on that cross for your sins. Second thing is you got to repent of your sins. Acts 2.38 says, Repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, repentance is a constant theme in Scripture. It's the acceptance of the fact that you need to turn away from sin and turn toward God. Number three, you confess Jesus as your Lord. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice it doesn't talk about confessing sins, but in confessing that Jesus will now be the Lord of your life. You are giving him full control of all that you have and all that you are. See, there's a difference there, isn't it? And then finally, number four, get buried in the waters of baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power of baptism is not in the water. There's nothing special about that water. Understand that. But in the resurrection of Christ, we die, we are buried, and we rise to walk in the newness of life. See, it's as simple as that. Faith in Jesus, repentance of your sins, confession of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then being buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. That's it. Nothing we have to pay for, is there? Nothing we have to pay for. I'm going to close with a story of a man, and he did just that. He became a Christian because he heard about Jesus' blood. He was an important official, by the way, from uh, Ethiopia. And he had gone to Jerusalem to worship God. And we know him as the Ethiopian eunuch. You've probably heard the story before or read it. In Acts 9, we're told that this Ethiopian eunuch, uh, he was riding in his chariot. And he was reading from the book of Isaiah. But he didn't understand what he was reading. See, unknown to him... God had arranged for a man named Philip to be in the area to witness to him. And we're told in Acts 9, verses 26 to 33, this is the story of what happened. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, 
that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. It said, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. You see, this part of Isaiah 53 is just a small section about this powerful prophecy that Isaiah made about the coming Messiah. It's a portion called the suffering servant. It says this in Isaiah 53, 5, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. We used iniquity again there, right? We just talked about that. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And his, with his wounds, we are healed. Listen to how this is coming full circle here. In Acts 8, verses 34 to 39, it says this. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went, but went on his way rejoicing. It's a lot to happen there, isn't it? But listen to this. There's one, one thought I want you to take out of this. We understand that he was pierced for us, that he died for us. He died in a way that none of us can ever die. Blameless, clean. And so here's the thing is that that was the ultimate payment. We are washed in his blood. We are washed when we've made that decision to accept him as our Lord and Savior. Now one last thought about this as the worship team comes forward. Did you see what the Ethiopian did after he was baptized? Did you happen to notice what he did? He went on his way rejoicing. He was so excited about Jesus that it changed his whole life. He was a different person at that point. Now I realize that most of us out here are baptized believers. I don't want to assume anything, but uh, realize that the world is watching right now. The world is watching to see if Jesus has made any difference in your lives. The world is watching, yes. Let's face it. The world has no interest in a risen Savior because He hasn't become their Savior. But He is yours. He is your Savior. And if we don't Show others the reason that we're excited about Jesus. If they can't see that, then no one else is going to have a reason to. Amen? No one else is going to have that reason. So I want you to understand this. We have been washed in His blood. He has paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. And while we can talk about the heroes of people like on Flight 93, and make no doubt about it, they were heroes. There's none 
that can replace what has been paid for no other than Jesus Christ. We have been washed in his blood. What can wash away my sin? The blood of Jesus can make me... I'll get to all again. <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other can I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All right. Hey, that works, doesn't it? That's great. Understand this. We have been given a new life. Each of us, if we've made that decision, except Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've been given a new start, and we've been given eternity. We need to each be as excited as the Ethiopian eunuch after he was immersed in water and baptized, and he made that decision. We need to understand the world is watching, yes. The world is watching us for every little step that we take. When the things are going good in the world and when things are going bad in the world. And it's happening all the time. How are we going to show the light of, shine the light of Christ? What can we do each and every day? And that's something we have to ask ourselves. We have to examine our lives each moment. For those of you in here that have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just as was said earlier, there's an emptiness there. There's a void that you can try to fill over and over again with different things and different activities and, and money and all kinds of things the world will throw at you. You can try to fill that void, but know this, it will always run empty until Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. And then you have a new life. So if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, make that decision today. Believers in Christ, we do need to understand we have been washed in his blood. And with that ultimate sacrifice, we do have work to do, don't we? It's time to spread the good news and share the good news when there's so much bad out there, isn't there? I'm thankful for each one of you. Believers in Christ, if you're looking to join a body of Christ and you haven't already done that, this is the time to do it. We are stronger together. We are stronger as a body where each of us are arms and legs and feet and all that good, good stuff because we all have different gifts that God wants to use. Pull together. Pull together. We have decisions to make. Let's pray before we sing this final song and we sing some more praises to him. Father, we are grateful for an opportunity to share the hope that we have because of your son. Thank you for his shed blood. Thank you for, for sending that ultimate sacrifice. Lord, we can never repay that debt except to do our part to build your kingdom and to draw closer to your son. Father, may we do that. If there are decisions to be made, may they be made right now because we are not guaranteed tomorrow. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Thank you so much for being here this morning. What a blessing it is to see each of you. And I know there's some who are missing. Um, listen, there are a lot of people who need prayers right now. A lot of people. Um, there are a lot of people who need healing. Uh, even, of course, many, some in this body, but also so many outside this body of Christ. So this week, we need to be praying very specifically for those who are hurting, going through tough times right now. Uh, we need to take this time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, have a blessed week.